Good morning, Together Church. Um, I'm probably not a very familiar face to some of you, but those of you who don't know me, my name is Adam Butler, and those of you who do know me, that might be because I've actually been here a couple of times before, um, and so I'm thankful to Pastor Robbie for being given the opportunity to speak to you again this morning. Um, this is a, a beautiful facility, by the way. I love this building, and uh, so it's, it's good to be back with you this morning. Most of you probably don't know this, by the way. Uh, pastor Robbie was actually my youth pastor for a number of years as I was coming up in student ministry years ago. And so uh, he, among many other people in my life, have had some degree of spiritual influence on my walk with Christ. And so I'm grateful to him for that, but also, as I said, just to be welcomed back here. I'm grateful that he trusts that I'll be faithful to uh, God's word this morning. Now, those of you who were here the past two times that I've been given the opportunity to speak might remember that each time that I've spoken, I've started off the sermon by giving you kind of an update on my life as it pertains to my wife, Sydney. The first time was in 2021, and it was actually this month of 2021, and I remember that very vividly because not even 24 hours prior to me giving that sermon, I had actually asked her to marry me on Sullivan's Island and so I was very ecstatic that whole weekend. It was a great weekend, and I was pleased to announce from the stage that morning that she said yes. Um, so then I got invited back in 2022 in December, and uh, it was actually just a few months after we got married, so I was pleased to announce that we did end up getting married after I asked her. And so um, I figured we would keep that trend going this morning, and I'll give you kind of the next installment in the Butler saga this morning, and that is that we are both pleased to announce that we are expecting our first child come this December. So, uh, And this is something that we've prayed for and that God has blessed us with. So baby Riley, um, he will be here in December. December 22nd is when he's supposed to arrive, but we know that that could be before or after. We don't know what's going to happen, but what we do know is that we are just overjoyed, absolutely over the moon about him. We love him so much already. And so um, if you're uh, praying this morning, be praying for that for us, that we will be wise parents. Um, but we're just ecstatic. And uh, the thought of becoming a father, honestly, is a little bit overwhelming, but it's also uh, overly joyful. And luckily, I had a very good role model to look up to, to kind of model what a godly father should look like. So if I can get somewhere within the ballpark of where my dad was for me to be that way to Riley, then I'll know that I'm doing at least something right. But, but we do pray that Riley will ultimately honor his parents and that uh, he'll recognize that though he has an imperfect earthly father, that he does have a perfect heavenly father who loves him uh, even more than Sydney and I could ever imagine. So, but we do pray that he would uh, honor his earthly father and honor his heavenly father as well, which is what we're all called to do, to honor our heavenly father, which is actually the topic of uh, the sermon this morning. How's that for a transition, right? So in Malachi, that's where we're going to be camping out this morning, so you can go ahead and turn there if you'd like. It's easy to find because it's actually the last book of the Old Testament. And from what Pastor Robbie tells me, you guys have kind of been going through the Word so far this year, and I understand that that means you're kind of jumping around a little bit, but I think you've been focusing on preparing the way for the Messiah, from what I understand, and that's where we land this morning in Malachi. So while you're turning there, Malachi chapter 1 is where we'll be. Much of what I'm about to say is probably going to be recap, since Pastor Robbie has probably already given you sort of the rundown on where we are in the Old Testament. But I, I'm a big picture kind of guy. I like to see the Bible from a bird's eye view so that when I own in on the uh, little details, the, the books and the chapters, I can kind of understand what's going on a little bit better. Because if we're not careful, don't we all tend to take things out of context? So what, what we'll do is we'll take one verse or one passage and we'll take it out of its context and read it in isolation, which is not a bad thing in and of itself, but it's dangerous if we don't get the rest of the story. Because you wouldn't open up a novel and start reading halfway through. You want to get the big picture. So I like to get the big picture of things and understand where we are in the biblical meta narrative. So Malachi, as I said, last book in the Old Testament. Now the Old Testament, it, this is important to know, is largely an account of God's relationship with his people Israel. Not all of it, but much of it is God communicating through different means to his people Israel. It's descriptive um, historical narratives of God talking to Israel. So, um, in fact, it's been said that roughly 70% of the Bible is about Israel. So, needless to say, they play an important role in the scriptural narrative. But the Old Testament largely is God talking through different means 
to Israel. So God sets apart a people for himself called Israel, and he uses Israel as the means by which to bring about the bloodline of the Messiah, who ultimately is what all of Scripture is about. So while it's equally true that about 70% focuses on Israel, 100% is about Jesus, the Messiah. And so Jesus is the key to understanding both the Old and New Testaments. So though he's not mentioned necessarily by name in the Old Testament, he is anticipated in the Old Testament. In fact, I've heard it this way. The New Testament is concealed in the Old Testament, and the Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament. So Jesus is the central figure, the key to understanding both of those uh, divisions of Scripture. So that being said, 100% of Scripture is about Jesus, the Messiah, and in Malachi, we're in the section of Scripture where we're preparing the way for the Messiah. So they're anticipating the Messiah's arrival. They don't know that it's going to be a guy named Jesus yet. They don't know when he's going to arrive. They don't know what that's going to look like. But they know that there is a Messiah who was promised and prophesied, and he's coming someday. So in the Old Testament, we're actually under, or Israel rather, is under an old covenant. This is actually why we have Old and New Testaments. It's specifically talking about Old and New Covenant. So this is also important to know because the Old Covenant, as the writer of Hebrews says, is obsolete. So there are things in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, that no longer directly apply to the church today, but were specific to Israel, okay? And this is a lot of information, I know, but this, is, this helps us understand where we are in the story. So the Old Covenant, there were certain laws that Israel had to follow in order to be set apart as that pure people to bring about the bloodline of the Messiah. So this is the, the short answer to the question, can we eat shrimp and can we wear clothes with two different fabrics? Because you'll see some bizarre things in the Old Testament, but remember that things that are not repeated in the New Testament that are in the Old Testament were largely specific to Israel as a people. There were ceremonial laws, there were sacrificial laws, and there were things that they had to do as Israel under a theocracy of God. But now that we're under the new covenant, which was the old was fulfilled by Jesus and he established the new covenant, now that we're under that covenant of Jesus, both Jew and Gentile, all people can be saved through believing in Jesus now that we know his, his name is Jesus. Okay, all of that is to say, that brings us to where we are this morning. And one of those ceremonial laws that I mentioned that Israel was following was that they were bringing sacrifices to an altar to offer up as worship to God. And the priests were the people who were bringing these sacrifices. So they were literal animal sacrifices. They'd be put on the altar, and they were offering them up to God. And so Malachi is a prophet. He's a minor prophet, which minor and major just means in terms of length, not importance. So the major prophets, these are like Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, the really long books in the Old Testament. Minor, they just means they're a little bit shorter. Malachi is a pretty short read. But the prophet's job was to call the people of Israel back to repentance, because Israel has a history in the Old Testament of following God for a season and being faithful, but then they would turn to uh, create false gods and raise up idols, and they'd worship those instead. And so God sends the prophets to say, what are you doing over here? Get, get back over here. And, and he calls, the prophets would call them to repentance, and to repent just means to turn back to God. And Malachi is one of those prophets who's calling the people to repentance. Now, the thing about repentance is that repentance messages are never uh, happy and uh, easy to hear. Repentance is a hard message to hear. So sometimes the prophets had to be a little bit direct in what they were saying. So you'll read some things, some messages from the prophets, and you'll think, man, that's a little bit harsh. Like, I don't think Pastor Robbie would preach to us that way. But you got to understand that where they were is they're drifting away from the God who set them apart and they're turning to false gods and the prophets were there to call them back and say, you're going in a terrible direction and its end is in destruction and you've got to turn back to the God who saved you. So this is where we are. The prophet's job is to represent God for his people and then the priest was to represent the people for God. So what the priests were doing is they're bringing these sacrifices to the altar, but over time, they bring these sacrifices, and they're, they're hearing this phrase, okay, the Messiah is coming. Remember, they knew that the Messiah was promised, so the Messiah is coming. Okay, we're ready. Bring the, we're bringing the sacrifices. The Messiah is coming. Okay, bring it on. We're ready. Keep bringing these sacrifices. And time after time after time, over years of this happening, those sacrifices and that act of worship just got a little bit mundane, 
and it became a routine because they were so used to doing it, and they just got, kind of got lazy in what they were bringing to the altar. It's like, okay, the Messiah's got, yeah, yeah, we, we know. We've heard it a million times. Here's your freaking goat, God. You know, it's like, so it just gets routine. So you ever done something so many times that it just becomes a routine for you? Like you don't even have to think about it anymore. Um, I drive to work pretty early in the morning, so it's still dark outside and I'm a little bit groggy, but I'll be going to work and I'll make it more than halfway to my job before I'm like, how did I get here, right? I mean, did I already pass the KJs? You ever done this before? I'm not the only one. I actually looked it up. There's a term for it. It's called road hypnosis. When you drive a particular path so many times that eventually you don't even have to think about driving it anymore, and you just kind of doze off as you're driving. It's really terrifying to think about, but it happens to us because we're so used to doing it that it becomes a routine. It becomes mundane, and it's like second nature. It's like we don't have to think about taking a shower or brushing our teeth because that's just part of our routine. Nobody is like, man, I took a shower yesterday. Guess what? I get to do it again tonight. We just do it without even thinking about it because it's part of the routine. Well, unfortunately, this is what happens in many aspects of our lives and not just in the day-to-day -day things, but in bigger things as well. Sadly, this can often happen in our marriages and um, men, a lot of times we're guilty of this, we'll pursue a woman and we'll pursue her and pursue her and pursue her and we want nothing more than to be with her. And so we go out of our way to impress her and just to buy her flowers and gifts and we spend all this money and all this time on her and we just want nothing more than for her to want to be with us. And then finally the day comes and we make it to the altar and then that's where the pursuit stops. And then it's like, okay, I made it, Whew, I can coast. Whereas Biblical marriage says th that's the opposite of what should happen. The pursuit doesn't stop there. That's where it begins, and it doesn't stop this side of eternity. That the rest of our lives with our spouse should be a constant pursuit of trying to, as Scripture says, outdo one another in love and acts of service and making them feel loved and reminding ourselves that we get to be with this person that God has blessed me with. And so it's a constant pursuit. This is why Sydney and I, we prioritize things like date nights, um, we've only been married for going on two years in September, so it's not that long, but that's a pretty long time. But we know what can happen if we don't continually feed that passion for each other. Because here's the thing, a fire will continue to burn as long as it's being fed. So when you stop feeding that fire, it will inevitably go out eventually. So we know how serious it is to prioritize each other. And so sometimes that doesn't even look like going out and spending money because in today's economy, you can't really afford to do that anyway. But sometimes for us, date night is as simple as watching a movie in bed with a bowl of popcorn. That's date night. And, and but why that's date night is because we're putting aside all of our distractions. We put aside our phones. We, we focus on each other and whatever uh, thing that we're enjoying together. And then we just prioritize the, the presence of being with each other. And we want to make each other feel loved. And so this is why it's so important to never lose the passion for something that, uh, of what we're doing. So this happens in our marriages. But unfortunately, and my fear is, for many of us, this is what's happening in our relationship with God. Notice I didn't say that this is where we're headed if we're not careful, but for many of us in our churches today, this is where we are. We've lost the uh, passion for God. We've lost the uh, pursuit of God, as it were, and we're just kind of coasting, and it's become a routine and the fire isn't there, and we're not feeding that fire. And in our churches today in, in, in America, and I know that this happens in other parts of the world, but I'm speaking primarily in America here because, in case you didn't know, this is where we live, and so this is our context. And unless you're called to global missions, by the way, this is your mission field. When you hear missions, a lot of times we think of what happens overseas, but your mission field is, as Pastor Robbie said a couple weeks ago, I believe, God has sovereignly placed you in the time and place that you are. This is, he's quoting from Paul, for a reason, because this is your mission field. God puts you where you are, where, when you are, to fulfill his purpose in your life. So don't feel like just because you're not called somewhere across the seas that you're not on mission. But in our churches today in America, we've just gotten lazy and we've gotten routine, and, and worship is not something that's focused on the glory of God, and we've made it all about us because it's, it's available to us. And so the fire is just not there, and so we're not on mission for God. We're on mission for our glory. And so we start to get into this mindset of, well, I just, I, I, you know, I got to go to a church that has comfortable seating, 
And it's got to have AC, right? I mean, we're in the middle of July. So, yeah, man, you gotta have, it's got to have a, a nice facility. And, it w- man, I, I would really like it if the band were at least somewhat talented because nobody wants to go listen to screeching on a Sunday morning. And, you know, while we're at it, we might as well have a good light show and some nice smoke on the stage. And we got to have all this cool aesthetics. And, man, the pastor, he better be culturally relevant. And I don't want him to get up there in a suit and tie. Maybe he needs to wear some J's or something and you know, just put on some nice clothes. And, and God forbid that he call me a sinner who needs to repent before a holy God because that's just not it in 2024. He needs to tell me how to live my best life now, and they need to have a latte waiting for me when I walk in the doors of the church. And for many of us, and we laugh because it's silly to hear, but we would never say that, but that's that's where our mindset is. And I'm not talking about Together Church, but in many parts of America, the pursuit and the passion for God is just not there because we've made it all about me, and it's, I want to be comfortable, and how do I want to worship instead of asking, how does God want to be worshiped? So if the pastor doesn't tell me what I want to hear, I'm out. And here's the thing, this shouldn't surprise us because this is exactly what Paul said would happen when he says, the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. He says, look, a time is coming when people are only going to want to hear what they want to hear. They won't endure what they need to hear. They won't endure sound doctrine. And so when that happens, we take worship, something that's meant to be solely about the glory of God alone, and we make it about the glory of you. And it's you, and, and you're so awesome, and this is the message that's within our culture. This is why our churches are looking more and more like the culture, because we're taking the message of the culture. It's all about you, and, and you're so great, and you're so cool. And so we take that, and instead of bringing the church into the world, we've taken the world and brought it into the church. And what happens when we do this is we adapt this idea of it's all about attractionalism. We just want to make as many um, seats filled with butts as we can and and make our numbers high. And we just want to make it so attractive that it's all about us and, and making us feel good. And that takes the church and it takes corporate worship and it turns it into this consumer driven model that's all about trying to market and sell something. But worship doesn't need to be sold. Worship needs to be cherished and enjoyed and, and the glory needs to be put back on God. So, but this is, this is the message that's within our culture, is it not? Everywhere you turn, it's all about you. And you're so cool, and you're so perfect, and you're so cute, and God just couldn't help but die for you because it's all about you. But listen to me, church. God didn't die a brutal death on a Roman cross because you're awesome. He died because you're not awesome, but he is. And he loved you enough, and he's gracious, and he's slow to anger. And as Peter says, that he's waiting for people to come to him. He's not willing that any should perish. God died for his glory and our salvation. We're the benefits of of his death. But it's not about us. And so we're tickling, itching ears in many of our worship services this morning without asking, how does does God want to be worshipped? How are we to worship God biblically? And how do we go from having a me-centered view of worship to a God-centered worship? So the way I'll frame it this morning is this. Is our worship worthless or is it worthy? Do we have a worthless worship, or do we have a worthy, God-honoring worship? So Malachi chapter 1, we're just going to focus on a few verses this morning. Um, Starting in verse 6, it says this. It says, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? If I am a master, where is my fear, says the Lord of hosts, to you, O priests, who despise my name? But you say, well, how have we despised your name? And he answers, by offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show favor, says the Lord of hosts. And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us, With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts. So as I said from the start, the prophet messages are often a little bit direct because the call to repentance involves conviction and uh, that's never an easy thing to hear. But he says, lame sacrifices. 
So the, the priests, again, they're the representatives for Israel. They're the ones that are bringing the sacrifices to the altar, and they're bringing these pathetic excuses for sacrifices, ultimately not what God requires. So they're doing it with this mindset of, okay, well, this will suffice. You know, God won't be mad. We know that he's a, a slow to anger kind of God, and, and he'll be okay with this. We've got seven, you know, decent goats over here, and, but one of them, it looks like it's, gosh, it's missing a leg, and, and it's blind, and there's flies coming out of its eyes, and so it's got some kind of disease. This can be God's portion. You know, here you go, Lord. There's your cut, and we'll just keep these nice ones to ourselves. If we were to put ourselves in, this, in their shoes, it sounds kind of strange to us because we're like, we would never do something like that. I mean, imagine for a second. So my wife's birthday is coming up in just a few months. And let's say that I want to get her something nice. And so maybe there's a dress that she's been wanting. And so I've got this budget put aside for her birthday present. And I go out looking for her a birthday present. And I want to get her a nice dress. I want to get her something that she wants. And so on my way into the clothing store, and I'm walking toward the dress aisle, and then I, something catches my eye, and I see a really nice shirt that I would like to wear. And so I'm like, well, let me, let me get this shirt for me as I'm making my way to the dresses. And then I see a really nice watch, and so, well, now this would be really cool. And so I get this watch for me, and, well, I've already got a shirt and a watch. I might as well get a new pair of pants to go with this, and, and, and you got to have shoes, right? And so I get a brand new pair of shoes, and I'm all the while I'm making my way to the dress aisle for my wife, which is the original thing that I went in there for. And by the time I make it to the dresses, I've got like $5 left in my pocket and not nearly enough to afford something nice for her. And so, oh man, so I spent it all on myself. And so I'm like, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. I mean, I, so I walk out and as I'm walking back to my car trying to think of what to do, I see there's a dumpster behind the store and, it, and something catches my eye. There's a dress that's kind of draped over the top of the dumpster. And so I walk up to it, and it, it looks, it, it's almost her size. It's maybe three or four sizes too big for her, but I, maybe she can make it work. And I think that's a hot dog chili stain. We'll just go with that. And it's got a few tears in it. Maybe it's missing a sleeve. This will suffice, and this will do. And so maybe I take it home and try to clean it up as best I can. But I wrap it up with a nice big bow, and, and I present it to her. And here you go, babe. Happy birthday. And I'm wearing this brand new outfit myself because what I've done is I've taken something that was meant to be her portion and I've spent it all on myself and given her some excuse for a birthday present. And she's my wife. She's meant to be cherished and honored. And it's her birthday. It's not even about me. But I've made it all about me and I've given her literally the leftovers. So can you imagine if we were to do this? But this is exactly what's happening with these sacrifices. They're giving God their leftovers. And he says, if I'm a father, where's my honor? He says, I'm the God who brought you out of Egypt. Where's my honor in all of this? Who do you think you are? I mean, you call this a sacrifice? What is that thing? It's a goat with missing three legs. So they're giving God leftovers. And we, we do this all the time with our resources, with our finances. We I gotta look out for me, right? I mean, it's, I, I gotta be comfortable. Well, I gotta eat. I gotta provide for my family. That's true. Paul says, if you don't work, you don't eat. But I, I, I got to have a brand new car, too. I mean, I, everybody's driving them. I got to have something that's comfortable, something that's, you know, brand new. I got to have the latest model iPhone. I have to have all of the 17,000 streaming services that are out there, Hulu, Netflix, Amazon, whatever it might be. I got to be comfortable, right? I got to look out for me. And then what is left over? Well, here you go, God. Here's, here's your cut. And you know what? And sometimes we're like, you know, I'll even be generous this month. I'll give you 15% because I only did 10% last month. As if God is up in heaven just in awe of what we brought to him. Like, man, thank you. Your leftovers? I've been waiting around for this. Not realizing that all of it is God's to begin with. See, here's the thing about giving money to God. It's not about how much are we willing to give. It's how much are you willing to keep to trust God with. Because it's all his to begin with. Whether it's 10%, it doesn't matter. What matters is all of this belongs to God, and nothing that we have doesn't come from his hand to begin with. So whether we earn this money or not, whether we earn our, our situation or not, everything belongs to God, and maybe we need some more contentment in our lives. Well, we live in America, right? We've got the resources. Why not enjoy the blessings? Well, maybe it's more about being content. Paul 
the Apostle Paul describes contentment very simply. He says, if you've got food and shelter, you're content. That's real content. If you've got a roof over your head and you've got food, then you're good. You've got everything that you need. And so, so listen this morning, church. This isn't in my notes, but we're here for just a little bit. Just a little bit. And then we've got billions upon billions upon billions of years of eternity after this. And so storing up treasures that moth and rust will destroy and that we can't take with us in the grave, the Bible basically says is dumb. It's just, it's dumb. It would be like walking into a hotel room that you're staying for two nights and changing the decor and buying a brand new mattress and ripping up the carpet and making it so nice when you're just going to check out two days later. But that's what we do when we store up for ourselves treasures on earth that we can't take with us in heaven. So he says, where is my honor? And he says, if I'm a master, where is my fear? He says, don't you fear God? Don't you have reverence and respect for him who created the heavens, the earth, and everything in it, including you, the one who has the power to move us from this life to the next in a split second if he chose to, but he's gracious and he doesn't. And the one who has the power to remove the very breath from our lungs with which he says to the priest, you're despising my name. And this is not a, a fear as in like a fear, I'm so scared I want to get away and, and run and hide. Although if God were to appear in our midst this morning, that's probably what we would do. I mean, anytime anybody encounters God in scripture, they usually do one of a few things. They either fall on their faces or they weep or sometimes they die, right? Because God is so holy and we are so imperfect that our sinfulness and God's holiness can't exist in the same place at the same time. That's why Jesus had to come to be the mediator. But when Isaiah, another example, is given a vision of the throne room of God in Isaiah chapter 6, and he's standing before God himself upon a throne, the God who is so holy that even his own angels can't look upon him, what does he do? Does he, oh man, I got to get a picture of this. No, he, he weeps. He says, woe is me, I am undone, or some translations say, I am finished because I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. Isaiah is literally saying, I'm about to die because I'm in the presence of a holy, perfect, righteous God right now. And then we know how that story plays out. He ultimately, God says, who will, send, who will I send? And he says, here I am, Lord, send me. But this is a healthy, holy fear of God. It's the kind of fear to where you can look at a lion this beautiful, majestic creature with the mane and the, and the fur and the, and the teeth. And you can look upon it and you can see this majesty all the while keeping in mind that this is a ferocious creature that could devour you in a second and there's nothing you could do to save yourself. This is the kind of fear with which we look at God, that God is ferociously holy. The Lion of Judah is ferociously holy and is so set apart that we... We come before him with a fear and with a holy reverence and an awe, knowing that there's nothing that we've done to be able to deserve to be in his presence, but he's gracious and loving and slow to anger and just merciful to us to where he offers that relationship to us. Not because of anything that we've done to earn it, not because of how cool we are or he thought that we were just so great. No, he did it out of his grace and out of his mercy, and we choose to either accept or reject the free gift of salvation. But we didn't earn the gift. He gives it freely, not because he had to, but because he chose to. This is the God that we worship. We fear him knowing that he is an eternally powerful God, the God who scripture says, every knee will bow, either today or someday. Humble thyself or God will. So we go back to Malachi. He says, present that to your governor. Like even your political leaders wouldn't accept these sacrifices that we're bringing. And yet we try to bring this before God, present that to the governor, see if he'll accept it. The implication, of course, is like, no, all right, well, then that should tell us something. So this returns me kind of to this question that I framed at the beginning of the sermon, namely, are we offering a God, uh, worship to a God that is honoring to him and that makes his name great, or are we offering the kind of worship that's ultimately not what he desires? See, God is not some vindictive bully who's like, you got to worship me my way, and, and that's, that's the way it is just because I'm mean and I want to make your life miserable. No, God is holy by nature, and so we worship in the way that he wants to be worshiped, not because he's mean, 
but because he's holy and he's perfect and he's just. And as I said, we don't, we don't earn a relationship with God. We recognize the God that he is. So are we offering him a worthy worship or a worthless worship? Are we offering him the kind of worship that ultimately Nadab and Abihu in the book of Leviticus offered up in what Scripture says an unauthorized fire, and they were destroyed by it because they were worshiping God in an unholy manner? Or the kind of worship to which Jesus says of lukewarm Christians, I will spit you out of my mouth. That's some pretty harsh language. That's Jesus in Revelation. But the point is, is that he says, would that you were either cold or hot. Like, be one or the other, but don't be somewhere in the, on the fence not doing anybody any favors. So are we offering him a worthy worship, one that makes him great and glorifies his name, or are we offering a worthless worship that's all about what makes us comfortable and what we want to do? And to answer this question, we first have to define worship rightly. So you can't know how to worship God without knowing what worship really is. And to define worship rightly, we first have to address what it is not. So here are a few things. Worship first is not just singing, okay? When we hear worship, we often think of just singing on a Sunday morning and uh, what happens here on Sundays. You know, singing is an act of worship, and singing glorifies God, and so we worship through our singing, but worship is so much more than merely music and song. And then that brings us to the next thing. Like I said a second ago, worship is more than what just happens on Sunday morning. This is corporate worship. This should be a given. But Sunday morning worship should be the starting point, not the end point. So in other words, this is the launching pad for what happens the rest of the week. The question is not, are you worshiping uh, corporately? The question is, how are you worshiping Monday through Saturday? Are we worshiping God throughout the week? Are we worshiping God in our jobs? Scripture says that work as if you're working unto Christ, not as unto man. Are we worshiping in our jobs? Are we giving God glory in our jobs? Are we worshiping in everything that we do? Um, Scripture says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all unto the glory of God. So you can glorify God by eating and drinking. Are we worshiping God in our marriages? Men, are we worshiping God by leading our families in prayer and leading our families to study God's word? Are we being the the, uh, spiritual leaders that God has uh, set us up to be? Women, are we, are we leading God in our marriages? Are we leading God parents by discipling our children? I mean, are we uh, worshiping God through discipling our children? And then children, are we worshiping God through honoring your father and mother? Everything that you do, every aspect of life is worship unto God if it gives him the glory. So there's not an inch of this universe that's not a part of his sovereign uh, hand. So everything that we do can be an act of worship if it gives him the glory and if it takes the attention off of me. Then the last thing, worship is more than just the band, the lyrics that we sing. It's more than the aesthetics on a Sunday morning. It's more than the feelings that we get from worshiping, although worship does often elicit an emotional response. But it's more than just that. See, feelings are important, but feelings should follow our belief. They shouldn't drive our belief. Because oftentimes we believe things based upon what we feel, and we make it all about feelings and emotions in our culture today. And so while our culture is saying, follow your heart, Jeremiah says that's a terrible idea. If you were to believe everything based on what you feel, you'd be in a load of trouble because Proverbs says there's a way that seems right to man, but its end is in destruction. So worship is more than just the warm fuzzies that we get during Waymaker because you can get all those feelings at a Taylor Swift concert. So it has to be more than just feelings-based. But like I said, feelings come from worship, but they're not based on worship. The last thing, I said that was the last thing, but I'm going to add one more thing, that worship is not, worship is not about me. Worship is not about me. Worship is an acknowledgement of and surrender to the worth and the glory of God himself. This is where the word worship ultimately comes from. We're acknowledging his worth-ship. We're looking unto God and giving him the glory, and we're acknowledging his worth as our creator. We give him the glory, and we make his name great and not our own. We surrender to his will and not ours, and then we make his name great and not our own. So genuine worship takes the focus off of me and places it on Christ, which is where it belongs. Genuine worship is always centered around Jesus. 
So it's Jesus and Jesus alone by whose name we are saved. There's no other name by which man may be saved is what scripture says. He gets all the glory, all the honor, all the praise, and we surrender knowing that we're sinners before a holy God who are called to repent and turn to him. See, this is the thing about right worship. Right worship ultimately begins with a right view of God. This is the, the trap that we fall into, which leads to worthless worship, is that we ultimately have a false or an incorrect or a deluded view of God. We don't honor him and we don't fear him because, see, God, the God of the Bible is not my, my buddy. Like, oh yeah, God's on, God's on my side. Me and God, we're cool. You know, God's my friend. He's my pal. No, the God of the Bible is a, as I said, a ferociously holy God that we bow before, that we fall on our faces before, knowing that he is set apart and we're not. We're imperfect and he's perfect. So worship is not about me. Worship begins with a right view of God. And that's so hard to do in our society, if we're honest. Because like I said a moment ago, everywhere you turn, every social media influencer, every celebrity, every app, every trend out there is making it all about you. And it's you and it's live your best life now, follow your heart, live your truth. And God says, no, follow me and live truth according to God's word, which is the ultimate absolute truth. So our view of God has to be one of holy reverence, surrendering surrendering everything to him. And to do that, we actually have to study his word. So you can't have a right view of God without actually knowing what his word says. So we have to know what we believe and why we believe it, because the way that God has chosen to communicate his truth to us, which, as I said, is the absolute truth, is through his word. This is the primary way that God communicates. So if anyone's ever saying, well, I don't really hear God talking to me, the first question they should ask is, how much time am I spending in his word? Now, he communicates through other means. He communicates through his general revelation, which is nature and things like this. He's given us his general revelation as a means to glorify him. In fact, Scripture says that if we're silent, even the rocks will cry out. But the primary way that God communicates is through his word. This is the reason why we have the Bible to begin with, because this is his special revelation. This is the book by which we get our marching orders, by which we know what it means to honor Christ, by which we know what it means to glorify God, by which we know what it means to be saved. And so we have to know what his word says in order to develop a right view of God and in order to know how to worship him rightly. When I was in college, one of my professors had a phrase that he would use often. Uh, He would repeat this uh, time and time again when he was talking of Christian discipleship because he wanted us to get it. And it goes like this. He said, orthodoxy leads to orthopraxy. You say, well, what in the world does that mean? Well, I'm glad that you asked. Orthodoxy, that just means right doctrine or right teaching, right understanding of God's word. So knowing what we believe and why we believe it leads to orthopraxy, which is right practice or right living out of God's word. See, and and here's what we've got to get. You can't live out God's word properly without knowing what it says. Because what we'll do is we'll often create this false dichotomy as it's either the head or the heart, as if to separate the two as if they're exclusive, but they're not. Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and what? Mind. We can't separate the head and the heart because they're not exclusive. Uh, As Jen Wilkins says, the heart can't love what the head doesn't know. So, but we create this road with two ditches and we say it's either one or the other. We, we'll say, well, we don't want to get caught up in all the intellectual stuff, all the doctrines and all the theology. Let's just leave that stuff to the philosophers. We don't want to become Bible big heads. And then the, we just want to be focused on living it out. We want to love people, right? But the opposite ditch is, look, it's all about doctrine. It's all about doctrine. You've got to know everything there is to know about the Bible. If you can't quote a verse on a fly, then you're not a good Christian and it's all about knowing, and we make it so much about the head that it's, we know about God and we don't know him personally. So those are two extremes, and if we're not careful, we can fall into one of those ditches. But the biblical view is that there's a road that goes in between which says it's both and. It's not either or. It's the head and the heart. You have to know God's word in order to know how to live it out properly. We don't know it and then just keep it stored inside We know it, and then we live it out based on what we know. So we study God's word in order to know how to be a disciple, which a disciple ultimately is a follower of Jesus. 
Notice that Jesus doesn't say, go therefore and make believers. He says, go and make disciples. A disciple is a completely committed follower of Jesus. Colossians 1.10 says, So as to walk in a manner that is worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. 1 Peter 5.7 says, Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is within you. At some point, if you're vocal enough about what you believe, you will be challenged on it. And if nobody's ever challenging you, then you're probably not talking about it enough. But this is why Peter says, always be prepared to give an answer because somebody's going to ask you, why do you believe what you believe? Many of us know what we believe, but we don't know why we believe it. And then many of us, we couldn't even articulate what we believe. Why did Jesus have to die? What does it mean that he atoned for our sins? What does it mean that God is triune in nature, that he's one God in three persons? What, what do these core doctrines of the faith mean? We've got to study his word and to be on our faces before him daily in order to do this. And sometimes this involves some homework. And if I ruffle some feathers this morning, I apologize. That's not my intention. But sometimes this looks like more than just five minutes a day in the daily devotion on the Bible app. Now, that's not a problem. The means by which we get God's word is not the issue. Whether you're listening to it, whether you're reading it on the app, whether you're flipping the actual pages, that's not what's in question. What's in question is, are we actually putting aside the time daily to get on our faces before the Lord and just ask him to illuminate his word to us? Are we making time for him? Are we giving him our best or is he just getting our leftovers? See, sacrifices, this involves time as well. What time are we putting aside for God? It's not just what things are we giving to him. How are we honoring him with our time. So we have to make time for God. And when I've ever gotten into these seasons of maybe dryness spiritually where I'm not pursuing God as much as I was in a season before, my prayer always becomes a Psalm 63 prayer. And this is the kind of pursuit that we need to have of God, a Psalm 63 passion for God. What does Psalm 63 say? It says, O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, and my flesh yearns for you as in a dry and weary land where there's no water. And that's a very vivid picture of somebody who is just so enamored and so passionate about God and his relationship with God that he says, God, I want to want you so badly that it's as if I'm dying in a desert where there's no water and I'm just thirsting after God. And that becomes my prayer if I ever get into these drought seasons Because we know, everybody who's a Christian here knows that the Christian walk is kind of like this. There's highs and lows. There's hills and valleys. That's just how it is. Life is not a cupcake. Life is hard, and then we die, is what Greg Kokel says. But there's hills and valleys. And if we ever get into these valley seasons, that becomes my prayer. Lord, this is how badly I want to want you. Oh, God, you are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh just yearns for you as in a dry and weary land where there's no water. That's how badly I want to want God. So that prayer reminds us that we pursue God because he pursued us. We love because he first loved us. And so it's nothing that we've done to earn that favor and earn that grace because we're sinful both by nature and by choice. We were born into sin. We choose to rebel against God. And it's only because of his grace and his mercy through the person and the work of Jesus, who was God incarnate, who lived a sinless life that we couldn't. He was perfect because we weren't. And he offered himself as a substitute to atone for our sins. Substitutionary atonement, that's a big theological word. It just means Jesus in my place. Jesus bore the wrath of God, which was supposed to be poured out on us, but he bore it in our place so that we wouldn't have to. So he's our substitute. And it's through his brutal death on a Roman cross and rising from the grave after three days that anyone who places their trust in him will be forgiven and will be redeemed. Because on our own, we're in debt before God. We stand condemned under his righteous judgment. And scripture says that the best that we have to offer is just filthy rags. Like, here it is, Lord, that's, that's all I've got. Filthy rags, that's all we've got to offer. We didn't do anything to contribute to our salvation. God did everything necessary for us to be saved. All that we offered was every reason for him to reject us and for us to spend eternity in hell separated from him. That's the bad news. And then the good news, the gospel, is that Jesus offered himself as the sacrifice that we needed. 
So the gospel is true and it's available to anyone who believes, not based on what you've done, not based on any sin that you will commit. He covers those too. But it's based on what he did out of his grace and out of his mercy and out of his love for us. God wanted a relationship with us. He didn't want us to have to spend eternity apart from him. And so Jesus said, nobody takes my life from me. I offer it up willingly. Jesus offered himself as the sacrifice. So my question this morning, as we reflect on Malachi, is where, where's your heart this morning? Where's your attitude? Where's your commitment level? Are we giving God our best or are we giving him just our leftovers? And this can look different for every aspect of our lives because we're all in different seasons. If you're going through a storm and you think that, man, my storm doesn't really look that big compared to this person's storm, just remember your storm is big to you. So what's your attitude like in that storm? When you're going through a storm, are you asking the question, God, why are you letting this happen to me? Or are you asking the question, God, how can I still serve you even though my life is not the way that I would have planned it out? Because if you've been alive long enough, you'll realize that things don't always go your way. If we had it our way, we would wind up on a very destructive road, as Proverbs said. But where's your commitment level? Where's your heart? Most of you in here, if you were asked, I'm sure, if you love God, you would say yes. If you serve God, you'd say yes. But let's examine our hearts and let's say, where, where is our heart actually? When we stand before the King of Kings one day, which we all will do, what's he going to say to us? Was it all just lip service or is our heart actually committed to him? Now, everyone who's truly saved and has truly grasped that forgiveness from Jesus can say, yes, he will say to me, well done, good and faithful service. Scripture says that we can have an assurance of our salvation because not, of what, not because of the amount of faith that we have. Remember, faith is small as a mustard seed. It's because of the amount of the sacrifice that Jesus gave. But maybe there's some of you in here that haven't yet grabbed hold of that faith and grabbed hold of that sacrifice and maybe are holding on to some sinful habits. Maybe there's some things that are in the dark that only God knows about that you're allowing to keep you from truly giving, going all in that maybe you're holding on to that you don't want to let go of that are keeping you from truly experiencing grace and mercy. And my question this morning would be, where's your heart and where's your attitude and what is God telling you to do? What's God telling you to let go of? What's God telling you to offer up on your altar before him and say, here it is, Lord. It's all yours to begin with. I'm giving it all back to you. I'm letting go of everything. I'm taking up my cross and I'm gonna follow you and I'm gonna give you my whole life because we gotta be either all in or we're not in at all. So it's a daily commitment. It's a daily uh, sacrificing things and putting aside our old self and saying, God, you can have it all because it's all yours. My life, my breath, my family, my finances, my job, whatever it might be, whatever's holding you back, go all in because that's what God is calling all of us to. So as we reflect on that this morning, I'd like to pray um, with you all. Dear Lord, we know that there's nothing that we've done to save ourselves. We couldn't save ourselves if we tried. We're on a pathway to destruction because of our own sinful choices. But Lord, you loved us enough to offer Jesus as a sacrifice. So we don't have to bear the wrath of God, but we can experience grace and mercy. And every sin that we've ever committed and every sin that we ever will commit and every sinful habit and every selfish idea, Lord, you've forgiven all of those at the cross. The blood of Jesus is sufficient for all people and it's efficient for those who believe. And so we just, we call upon your name this morning that you would... Um, Open up our hearts to you, Lord, and let us know what it is that you're calling us to. What's our next step um, this morning? What, what are you calling us to specifically to put aside? Or how are you changing our attitudes to not offer up a worthless worship, but to change it to a, a worthy worship? And how are we robbing you of your glory? And how do we give that back to you this morning, Lord? And, and just say, God, we want to be all in, and we want to give you our lives and take up our cross daily. So, Lord, I pray that you would show each and every person in this room what that looks like for them because that might look different for every person in here. But what is the same is that we all live under your grace and your mercy and you're a loving father. You know how to give good gifts. 
God, you want us to be blessed, but you don't want us to fall in love with the blessings. You want us to fall in love with the blessing giver. So I pray that you would speak to our hearts this morning. Um, God, we just give you all the glory and all the praise and all the honor. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray these things. Amen.